Welcome everyone officially now to this observability clinic, getting started with observability driven DevOps and SRE. My name is Andy Grabner. I've been hosting these for a while. If you're live, ask questions in Q&A. If you are watching this either on YouTube or on Dynatrace University, then I'm pretty sure you'll find a way how to get a hold of us. We are active on the community uh, based on the names. I'm pretty sure you can also find how to catch us on LinkedIn or other social media. So feel free to ask questions. Um, we have a lot of material today, but Rob, um, just quickly, because we just kicked off the recording, uh, one word to what you do at Dynatrace. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, we uh, are representing both continents here. So I'm based in the United States, uh, where our headquarters is in, in Massachusetts. But my role is a technical partner manager. So I'm really working with the use cases that integrate our ecosystem partners. So as we go today, we talk about incident management tools, remediation tools, software delivery tools. Those are the things that are really enabled with cloud automation. So our team helps uh, you know, vet those out and, and we're looking to get many, many solutions certified and documented so you guys can uh, try them out yourself. Perfect. All right, and I already started answering the first couple of questions. So uh, you know we do this very dynamically here. But let's get let's get going. First of all, I want to start with what is actually observability driven DevOps and SRE automation. This seems like a mouthful. What this really is is helping organizations, and I brought two examples here from some of our customers and partners that use Dynatrace to automate things around getting new, better code into production, what we in generical terms maybe called DevOps engineering. If you have your automated delivery pipelines, Dynatrace helps these organizations to make better automated data-driven decisions around SLOs, like the example of Ergo and the customers Triscon, who have integrated Dynatrace into their delivery pipelines, where they are now getting automated feedback to apps that are coming out of development. They get automatically tested and evaluated and they brought it to a stage where they can use this as a self-service. So kind of orchestrating everything in the delivery process until things reach production. And on the other side, we also have um, Bert from, uh, from Inet, from Real Dolmen, uh, another great uh, example. They're also using the data-driven aspect to speed up delivery, but especially reducing manual work when you evaluate things around the delivery process, but also for your auto remediation process. So if you have a problem coming in, you can obviously create a ticket and then somebody manually steps in. But what we are going to show you today is also how you can use Dynatrace cloud automation capabilities to automate and orchestrate your remediation actions, your incident response, and at the center always have SLO service level objectives as kind of like your North Star, because our orchestration works in a way, and everything we teach today is that you always keep your systems healthy, and the health of the system can be defined by one or many SLO service level objectives. All right, uh, the way to get there is there's a couple of steps and we have five steps for you. First of all, is getting visibility into your existing releases. We know many organizations have many different tools and many different ways to get software deployed into different environments all the way up to production. We wanna show you how you get visibility into those existing releases. Second thing is, we want you to show how you can report and act upon SLOs for your critical services and applications. Then we talk about how we can actually use this data to automate your release validation process. If you're currently doing releases where manual steps are involved to validate if a release is good or not good or good enough to go to the next stage, then I show you something that Dynatrace does to automatically validate your release based on an SLO health score. Then Rob will jump in and show us how you can use our orchestration capabilities around SLOs to speed up your existing delivery pipelines. And the last thing that Rob will show us is how you can use the SLO driven remediation orchestration that Dynatrace provides to reduce mean time to re repair, react, uh, resume business, right? This is all about automating incident response. All right, I will cover the first three use cases and then Rob, I will have you come in for number four and number five. So the first yeah. one, yeah. Uh, the first one is getting visibility into your existing releases. There's a capability in Dynatrace, we call it the release monitoring view, the release inventory, where we show you exactly based on the monitoring data we have from our one agent, what is actually deployed where in which version. We can also link it to your release 
ticketing systems, whether you have Jira and other systems. So we give you a one-stop view where we show you what is currently deployed where, and also how does it connect to certain events that happen around the release process, including the option to actually link it with your ticketing system. So you see, are there any open tickets right now for a particular release? Now, demo, we have a lot of demos today. Let me switch over to, I have too many tabs open. Here we go. This is one of my demo environments. This is the release monitoring screen. And in my environment here, I'm focusing on a particular management zone, right? So if I go to all, let me just quickly zoom in here. Uh, Dynatrace will show me all of the releases that Dynatrace detects based on metadata that we collect from your from your containers, your pods, but also your, let's say, more traditionally deployed applications. I really like, though, the ability right in Dynatrace that we have management zones. Um, we can, it can be applied for many things like filtering. And in my case here, I see the release inventory screen. I see which type of release, right, the release name is deployed in which release version. Also, we give you the option of separating release version and build version, if that's something you do. To which stage does it belong to? Is it production? Is it staging? Is it dev? To which product does it belong to? Uh, also, how many instances are currently running? As you can see here, there's a, there's, there's a lot of information here that we just give you. And the nice thing about this is you get this information out of the box if certain metadata is being applied to the deployments that you do. And with this metadata, I want to highlight this as well. And for the people that are live, um, I'm also sending the link over. There is some documentation on the release monitoring feature. So under the configure, it says configure environment variables for release detection. This is really what I want to hand over and I'm sending this to the chat for everybody to see, but I'm pretty sure for those that are watching kind yeah. of this as a recording. Yeah, and Andy, I'm, I'm actually just for folks too, I'm answering some of the questions live uh, for you and I'll be happy to put that. Perfect, that perfect. Soon. Perfect. And also the one question that Rick is just asking, does this consume any DEMs or DDUs? No, this here is just taking the data that is already available. So behind the scenes here, if I click, let's say on the hipster shop, right, what I'm really seeing here is a different view on what we in Dynatrace call the process groups and the process group instances. So Dynatrace is monitoring already with the one agent processes. And uh, in the processes, there might be services that are monitored with Dynatrace with code level visibility, but here we're just focusing on the PGs and the PGIs. So hipster store is here. Uh, we give you that information. We show you how many instances are actually running um, and how the traffic is kind of currently going. Also very important, we show you events that are being pushed to that particular instance in Dynatrace. So you get everything in one view, no additional uh, no additional uh, licensing uh, necessary. It's really, if I go all the way down to the PGI, to the process group instance, you will see in a second um, uh, where we get the data from. So the data really comes from metadata. Either if this is a, a container that runs in, uh, in, a, in a Kubernetes or OpenShift environment, we either pull it out from these labels and annotations, right? part of name version, but you can also push uh, environment variables, because this then also works for any type of application, even those that are running on bare metal on Windows or Linux machines, right? So, but to answer your question, I think it was, um, it was Rick, um, there is no additional licensing. And that's very important. Now, the last thing I want to show you here, let me just quickly go back to my, uh, to my releases screen and also zoom out again a little bit, because that might be a little too big. Really important is also the whole release events. So here you can, for instance, see in one stop view, what events have Dynatrace observed or was Dynatrace been made aware of? So for instance, when particular processes were restarted or when uh, a process was promoted from one stage to another, if you have any automation tools that are basically taking and pushing artifacts through the system, we are also able to show you all of these events in context, when tests are being run, when a new deployment happened, always with links back. So this is truly, truly powerful. Um, I see a lot of great questions already coming in. Um, Robert, I know you're taking care of this uh, right now. Um, and we will go quickly back to my slides because in the slides, which you can also then later download from Dynatrace University next to the video recording, I just try to also give you the steps again. So what do you need to do in order to get this visibility? So what you need, you need to do is you need to add metadata 
to your deployments. As I explained, either environment variables, this was also explained in the documentation link that I gave you. So you can use these environment variables or if it's Kubernetes based or OpenShift based, you can, we also have these Kubernetes labels and annotations. And this is exactly what Dynatrace takes and then just fills this table for you with a view of what is deployed where in which version, All right? This is really what it is. Super, super easy. Um, I have a lot of use cases and I know a lot of questions are coming in. Some of them may have to wait uh, until later because I wanna make sure we're getting through this. Second use case for me is after you have seen and gotten visibility of your releases and once Dynatrace gives you that release view, the next thing for me is figuring out your SLOs. And with figuring out your SLOs, it means really defining SLOs in Dynatrace, service level objectives, so that you can give to your application owners, service owners, infrastructure owners, dashboards like this, where they see how is a certain critical service doing, right? Are you meeting all of your SLOs? In my example here, I have an availability SLO and a performance SLO. And then I really always like to start with, this is just the best practice uh, SLO dashboard. Uh, are there any things, any, any, any ongoing uh, challenges uh, when, right now, any ongoing issues? Are there any long running issues? Are there any permanent issues? And also over a longer period of time, what's the trend? Are we meeting our SLOs overall and so on and so forth? The nice thing with Anatrace is you can define the SLOs and then you can report and alert on them in different timeframes. All right, let me demo this for you. Setting up SLOs in Dynatrace. So if I go back to, now I'm going to my other environment here. So this is the dashboard that I've just shown you. But the way you would get started is in the menu, you can search for, as you can see, your SLO, right? SLO for service level objective. I'm just opening up in a new tab. You end up in the SLO screen. And this is the screen where in my case, I already see those SLOs that I have already specified that match my management zone. Remember, management zones are really cool. If I click on all, then I see all of my management, uh, of my SLOs that I've specified. Now, this is an environment that I typically use for workshops. I see some familiar names here on the call today. Some of you may have already done some of my workshops where I hand out a, um, a, an assignment to everyone. Everyone is responsible for running and operating a particular piece of uh, service for a different for organizations. And I'm, I'm, I decided to use Apple, Acer, Amazon, B, and you, can, okay, you get the idea. I just use used stock symbols. And in order to differentiate the data, in order to give us all a filtered view, I'm also using management zones. So in Dynatrace, management zones allow me to filter the data, give me my view of the data that I am responsible for, and it also is used for access control. Now, just a quick one on how you get started. Add new SLO. This is really uh, a nice wizard that you can use to create new SLOs. We have five presets. These are the most commonly used that we have seen. Service level availability, service method availability, user experience, mobile crashes, synthetic availability. Now, if you look really close, let me zoom out a little bit. And for those that of you that are familiar with Dynatrace um, and SLOs, then really what the preset does, it just selects a different, or it, pre, it, it kind of pre-populates uh, the metric query behind the C, we call it the metric expression, with exactly that expression to get to that particular thing. So for instance, service level availability is a classic one. This is the number of successful requests divided by the total number of requests, and then you get your SLI. But the nice thing is you can use any type of metric. And if you wanna learn more about this, we also already had other performance clinics, observability clinics on YouTube, where we walk through this in much more uh, step and much more detailed step But you. Define your indicator. So what is the metric, the base of your SLI, of your SLO? Then you define the filter section. This is where you give a time frame, And also you say for which entity. Now remember, I am responsible in this particular case for my services that live in a particular uh, tenant maybe, right? In my management zone, I can click on preview. I get all of my services that are part of this that Dynatrace knows about. Then I can add obviously more if I have some Kubernetes tagging here, right? Let's say Kubernetes, there might be a tag for, for production. That could be one. Or I could also go with the entity name. So I can say this one, this SLO that I'm defining is for the one service that is called AAPL service delivery production preview. 
just to make sure that I did everything right and then I'm good. And then the uh, last thing I do is I add some success criteria. So really nice and really uh, easy to do. I can specify a target and a warning. We also have the error budget burn down rate, which allows you to then also get alerted, not only if you if you are about to miss or if you're, if you're missing your SLO, but if you are on the trajectory to missing it because we're looking at the burn down rate. Then you can click on evaluate just to make sure and validate that the query that you've specified and the entity that you want to apply it to is actually delivering the right metrics, looks good. Um, a very important piece is obviously to give a good name. So this could be my availability uh, of, let's say, my business critic lab. Then give it a good description, maybe something like uh, rate of successful request metrics and so on and so forth. You click on create and you're done. And now I have my new availability metric, which I now can also, I can create an alert on it. I can clone it. I can change the definition. I can pin it on the dashboard or I can view it in our data explorer, which is what you can use to then uh, create a chart. So basically like what you have here with the chart, right? This would be then all available. So the end goal though is really to define your SLOs and then put those SLOs on dashboards that you can then use to observe and show people in which direction they're going, right? This is, I think, for very, very important for me to, uh, to get across. So very fast, I know, but if you wanna know more about this, remember there's always a more detailed recording we've already done. So this is the list for, of all of the YouTube videos we already have. And let me send this a link again to the chat. And you can see here, there's a lot of things in here. And if you search for SLOs on that page, uh, if I can actually type it all right, there's a lot of seven steps to identify SLOs, seven ways to get started. And this is where we actually walk through that wizard in more detail. All right, so this was the demo for setting up SLOs in Dynatrace. I wanna again, give you some advice on how you can get started. Um, the first step is to educate. What are SLOs? What is a good one? What is a bad SLO? Rob, with the two of us, we just came back from a tour where we visited different customers when we advised them on SLOs. And I really liked uh, the, the realization that SLOs is not about defining hundreds of SLOs to make you feel good because your backend systems are available and are performing well. It's really about thinking what really matters to the business success of that service application. That's why the customer experience is so important. And I think the term that we learned on our trip was the watermelon SLO. Red, green on the outside and red on the inside is not what you yes, want. Right? That's right, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's right. The whole topic of SLOs is, um, you know, it's really, we've got some other talks, but I, I would say, right, we're, we're trying to, you know, to help com companies standardize on their definitions of SLOs because a lot of folks don't agree on what is availability or what is um, response time. So the SLOs really helps facilitate that conversation for one. And, and, it, and it does kind of come from a couple perspectives. We always like to put things in the view of the customer or the service consumer. So, you know, is that available? Are they achieving the business goals from that is really a, a, the top level SLOs that we want to manage. But then as we go into the infrastructure, there's a lot of approaches. And that one link there on Zendesk talks about boundary analysis. So it's really, where are those interfaces to the chain of services that, that support a given business process or system process? And that's what will hopefully you know, be, a, be the path to you know, helping satisfy you know, mm -hmm. a green dashboard you know, on, on both ends. Yeah. Exactly. And also, thanks, Mohamed, for already posting the link to the Zendesk blog in the chat. That's awesome. Yep. All right, so step one is educate. Um, step two is understand the mechanics of SLOs. I know I walked through this rather quickly, but you get the idea. SLOs are made out of an SLI and of an SLO, which then is the objective. So what that means is an SLI is always a, a key metric to understand the health of a system. So the number of good events, 
divided by the total events. In my example earlier, I had the number of requests that are successful divided by the total events. And then you can specify the SLO, which is the objective. Like how many of those do you actually expect to be successful? What's your goal towards the business? What's your business commitment? And then we also have the concept of the error budget, which I really like. And I think it's, it opens up a lot of opportunity. So if you agree to a certain SLO, like 99.9%, .9%, the error budget is 0.1. And now if you do the math, if you, let's say, have a reporting period of 30 days and you do the math, 30 days, 0.1 error budget is only 43.2 minutes. So in, in over a month, you're only allowed to have a problem with your SLO for 43.2 minutes. That's not a whole lot. Dynatrace gives you all this data. Um, you can define it, you get it, and you can also then get alerted on how fast you're burning through that budget. Really cool thing. This is just a new capability that came in recently. Not only that we visualize the current error budget, but that we also now have a new metric for burn down rate that you can then also alert on. So sum it up this step. In the end, I really like starting with defining good SLOs and then putting it on dashboard. Availability and performance are always two great SLOs for me, for your business critical apps, and then also put them on a dashboard with different timeframes. And so the, you see, is there anything ongoing right now? or do we have any long running issues or is everything fine? Yeah, and actually that was one of the questions, Annie, that came up, you know, there's different there's different roles in companies from DevOps to SREs to, mm -hmm. to just the operation support. And so in each of these timeframes often is the view that they're working on, right? So we're managing maybe the SLA for a given month, but then sometimes, you know, on, on key events, there may be a smaller time frame where you're wanting to look at, you know, um, you know, like an hour or two after a given release or a given event. Mm -hmm. um, so the flexibility to kind of see both is, is, is what we see exactly. people doing. Exactly. Yeah. And so this was kind of step number two. I know we are, it's a lot of content and, uh, but you know, we are here, we have this follow-up webinars uh, as well on YouTube already, where we go deeper into each section. Now, my third step. So after we get visibility into our releases, remember that was the first step. We get the metadata, we show you what is released where. Second step is defining your business critical SLOs and start monitoring them and putting them on dashboards and set up alerting for especially production use cases. You want to know before you actually have a problem in production, before you're violating your SLOs. The next thing is you want to automate the validation of a new release also through SLOs. Because if you have a new release, then you want to know is this a good release or not a good release? Or if it is released already, Shall we keep it or have to we, do we have to roll it back because we're burning too fast to our error budget? Or things like, are all critical business features still working? That's very important, especially after uh, deploying a new version. So what this use case is all about, it's about not only defining an individual SLO, two or three SLOs, but really define what we call a release validation dashboard. And this can actually be defined as a dashboard, as you see it here containing health indicators across the stack from end user, you care if the end user can still access your application, but all the way, all the way down into your Kubernetes clusters, into your infrastructure, because these are all different health indicators from the different people that are responsible for the stack. So you can put them on the dashboard. We also have an S code configuration opportunity where you can define all of these rules in YAML as well and put it in a Git repository. But once you have specified this, Dynatrace can then automatically validate your health of an application, of a service in any environment, production or also on the way to production, and then looks at all of these indicators and comes up with a single SLO score. And this can then be used to make better decisions. And it can also be integrated in existing tools, right? If you have your deployment tools that you already use to deploy into production, I'm sure you have a process where you then also have maybe now a manual validation stage. This can automate that process. So let me quickly also show and demo this, um, keeping track of all of my tabs that are open. So earlier we looked at this dashboard. Now I'm telling you, I wanna have a dashboard that looks more like this, right? Because this is now kind of my health indicator. I call this the automated release validation dashboard based on production SLOs. Dynatrace detect the problems and leading indicators. This means when I am deploying into prod, I want to get a very quick answer on was this deployment successful? Or if you deploy into a testing or a staging environment and you run some load tests, you want to have a very quick 
answer on is this a good build or not a good build and this is why you want to build dashboards like this and with building dashboards this dashboard actually was automatically generated for me i'm working with one uh, of our colleagues arishan he and we are doing another performance clinic on this as well another tutorial where we are automatically generating this based on not only your particular uh, type of application like the stack that you're using but we also automatically set the thresholds because this is one of the biggest problems that people come to me and they say so what is a good threshold for response time or for host cpu or for memory usage or garbage collection or whatever it is what is a good one and then one of the things we are now providing with this automated generation we're looking at the reference time frame so you can say i want to create a dashboard like this that contains all the key metrics from the end user all the way down through my stack and depending on the technology java.net go we put certain metrics on there by default uh, that we think are important but then we also set thresholds already based on a reference time frame let's say based on last week's traffic based on the last release based on something you consider good so we have this dashboard and that's already great because we can easily see if i zoom out more right everything is green or red if something is red it's something i, I want to probably work on it but what we now on top of this provide is the ability to integrate this into your automation and have dynatrace automatically evaluate this dashboard for you so what you're looking at here this is what we call dynatrace cloud automation where rob will show us many more use cases later on but one of the key use cases really is the automated evaluation of releases based on these metrics that are put on the dashboard so what you see here is what you saw in the in the um, uh, in the screenshot earlier or in the dashboard earlier uh, right this is the, the analysis of every single metric on the dashboard for a particular time frame so you can trigger the analysis here from the deployment tools and then you get a total score back and this score back can then obviously result in whatever other action you want to take um, i want to show you one other cool use case here just to go to this uh, version here, because in my screenshots earlier, I gave you an example of integrating this with your deployment pipeline. So here I have an Azure DevOps pipeline and the Azure DevOps pipeline is deploying into staging and is then actually calling Dynatrace Cloud Automation to validate if this is a good build and based on that decides whether to push it into production. It seems the last one has actually failed. So let's actually walk over to Cloud Automation. So here we can actually see the analysis that was done by the last run, it clearly failed. But what we did here as well, it was not just evaluating if a particular build succeeded. Uh, one of the things we did is we also, and currently actually another build is running, what we can also uh, trigger as part of the release validation, right? In my case, Azure DevOps is deploying and then Dynatrace Cloud Automation can also trigger tests any test tool that you already have. And, and Rob, I know, will show much more what we can do. But I really like this because release validation is more than just manually clicking around and then looking at the dashboard. What we allow you to do is automatically executing tests and then also automatically evaluating and then feeding this back into your, into your pipeline. Right. And that's really that's, important. That's right. Yeah, and I and think, you know, we'll get into the more of the details, but right, I mean, this... The idea of cloud automation is that the, this functionality can be used in different use cases. So you're using, uh, a, 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 you know, the SLOs uh, here to kind of manage a little bit more an operational kind of view and timeframes and all of this on, I call it on demand service level uh, indicator uh, scoring, mm -hmm. which can be used in the, in the use case of what, what's a quality gate where we, we often refer to a, a software release and we want to evaluate the quality of a release that could be a quality gate or as andy said it's also a release verification so mm -hmm. being able to do something on demand um in an automated way is is a, is a, is a pretty great use case yeah and we just have mike kobush he just responded on chat as well he is one of our first uh kind of adopter of this technology and we also have a, vid a video with him on the youtube channel and he also said cloud automation can decrease analysis time from hours to just seconds he was integrating this also with his load testing environment right. uh, one last thing i want to show in the demo what i always always suggest as part of a release process i'm a really big fan uh, of our synthetic test capabilities now you may already have your existing synthetic test uh, testing tools in place in case you don't have it look at what dynatrace has 
I always create certain synthetic tests against my application that run on a regular basis to really validate, is my app up and running and, and especially are my critical use cases covered? So in my sample app, it's a very simple app, but I have one of these synthetic checks. Now, remember this, I know that not all of you have fully automated tests, but with synthetic tests that are validating, are your key use cases running? And are they successful? Are they responding within your time constraints? That means when you deploy into an environment, the synthetic tests will validate the new deployment. And then you can use the automated capability to look at the results from that synthetic test, but then also include all of the other metrics that I've highlighted earlier to really validate, was this a successful release, yes or no? And this is then fully automated. And this is so, so powerful for me. So to wrap up my second, uh, my last use case and then hand it over to Rob, the automated release validation, some, some, some best practices. Synthetic tests, I just mentioned it, but this is really, really powerful for me. If you have critical apps, make sure you have the critical apps and the critical transactions covered by a synthetic test. And you can define them either through the UI, we have a recording opportunity and then you can do it, but you can also automate this through monitoring as code. That means every Dynatrace configuration, including the synthetic tests, you can declaratively define them in JSON and in YAML and then apply it as part of a deployment pipeline, which means you can actually, the developers can maintain or your business people, whoever that is, can maintain the synthetic tests for your business critical apps next to the source code. And as you're pushing your application through the pipeline, one of the steps will be apply this configuration to Dynatrace. And then you have the tests. Once you have the tests, then you can create your release validation dashboards, right? As I've shown you earlier, right? right. Start with your critical yeah. SLOs and then go, go, go down the track. Right. And I'll just point out, I mean, maybe if it's not obvious <laughs> that these dashboards are custom dashboards. So we certainly advocate, you know, using automation and that's a, a power of any dashboard is just a configuration and Dynatrace. So they can be generated through uh, code mm -hmm. um, and that's powerful, but know that that's the flexibility here. So if you're, you know, monitoring a, um, a particular technology or, or, or layer in the stack, then these metrics can be customized for that kind of check. Uh, you know, these, these things can also incorporate um, user session data, right, Andy? We can also mm -hmm. do security data. So really, you know, we're showing you um, some examples and these are, are, are ones that we're kind of gathering as best practices that and what customers are, in, are, are using mm -hmm. and, and we're giving that feedback for folks. But um, as we'll get into the demo, I'm gonna do this, all this is, uh, you know, the, the settings of what you want your thresholds to be is all really up to you, you know? Yeah. So we, we um, you know, have this way of visualizing it as a chart because it's a natural way to see the metric in a time series way. Mm -hmm. But then if you, maybe if you, I don't know if you can't really zoom in on, on a slide, but, well, and I'll show it on, on when yeah. I get into it, but the thresholds can be, um, you know, set this way yeah. um, with tile by tile. Exactly. And uh, I will share some additional links later on on monitoring as code and, and so on. So the last step for the release validation. So define your synthetic test. That's a good, just best practice. Get your dashboard. And then what you can do is uh, use the automation capability. And I know there's some questions that just came in. So what is this cloud automation? Is this an external tool? Why does this look different? Is this differently licensed? Yes, cloud automation the component that I've used to show you the way we can orchestrate different sequences, but everything centered around the SLOs, one or multiple SLOs. Um, this is a special, not a special, an additional hosted component from us. So you can request it. Uh, you can ask your Dynatrace CSM. You can use the in-product chat to reach out. You can also follow up with us, Rob or I, and we can then uh, stand up and give you one of these. Uh, it is licensed through so-called cloud automation units. So when we orchestrate things for you, when we are automatically making data-driven decisions for you and then connecting all of your tools, um, every time you run one of these sequences and you're connecting tools, this is a cloud automation unit. The benefit for you is obviously you don't need to do things manually anymore. And you also don't need to build scripts that are connecting your tools. We are doing this for you. Should be rather straightforward. Uh, right now, this is a SaaS offering um, for our managed customers. Let us know if you are managed and you 
if you can expose the API to the outside world, obviously you can just get a cloud automation instance from us and it connects to your API that might be exposed to an active gate. Uh, if you're managed, managed, and for whatever reason you cannot do it, then we have, have other options as well. Um, just reach out to us, okay, to Rob and I. And yeah. Right, but, then, it, it, but maybe that's also like maybe what we're gonna show. So when you say, uh, integrated to other services, that's actually what we're going to show next. So there is, um, you know, what when we do one of these uh, sequences, you know, it can call out to, as you can see in this screenshot, um, Azure DevOps, for example, it can call to PagerDuty or LinkedIn. So, it, you know, that's the idea is that we're, we're calling, um, you know, SaaS uh, third party products at the kind of the chop, top of this chart, as well as it could reach out to custom code yourself. So if you had a Lambda function, for example, that had certain logic in it, you know, it could reach out to that as part of one of these uh, automated uh, orchestrated flows. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. So this was just also now showing uh, kind of the, the final circle of what I showed earlier from any tool, trigger the, the validation, return, get the score, return the score. <coughs> Easy. Now, Rob, it's your place to shine. Uh, yeah, because well, it's because... the team's place to shine. Yeah, I mean, we're, <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, you know, it's great. Yeah, so hopefully we'll get through this quickly so we can answer questions. Andy, I might need some of your help. People are asking a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah I, will, I, will, I will follow up. Um, I just want to introduce the use case because the use case, Rob, as you have also demoed in a previous webinar, is speeding up existing delivery pipelines, which means if you have anything that triggers a new workflow, then cloud automation can take the role of then orchestrating your deployment, your testing, your evaluation, and then depending on that, also uh, pass this on to um, a different stage, right? Uh, the most important piece here is we are orchestrating. That means we're not replacing your existing tools for deployment. You can still use your Argo CD, your Jenkins, your GitLab, whatever it is. You use your testing tools. What we are taking care of is stitching them all together through an event-driven model, and we take the Dynatrace data in the middle to then make data-driven decisions. And Rob, I know you did a great job already in showing this in 16 minutes. Now I only give you much less than this for this use case to walk us through this again. No problem. Yeah. So yeah. hopefully, right. So absolutely. We, we broke out these use cases in detail and I'm going to, so you want me to share and, and get yeah. that dive in? Okay. Yeah, please do so. I stopped sharing on my end and you can, and then I will also follow up with some of the questions. Okay. So what, what I'm gonna do is for this demo, I have a variation of, of Andy's application here, which is our, our simple, simple app. And um, what I'm gonna do is just demonstrate uh, that use case of, I of, mean, um, I'll just pull up my shipyard file. So here, this is, if, you're, if you haven't seen this, the way, the way uh, cloud automation is done is that through a declarative way of defining what we call sequences. So what a developer would do is, in my case, I'm in GitHub, but you're not limited to GitHub. It could be in GitLab, it could be in Azure DevOps. As long as it's a Git repository, then the way uh, cloud automation is interacting with is this project file, which is known as the shipyard file. So you can see in here, I've, we've got a definition of, of different stages. So I'm gonna do what Andy talked about as a multi-stage of going from staging into production, and it's gonna go through a release uh, flow, if you will. So we're going to uh, uh, note, you know, so what's going to happen is I'm going to in initiate this flow with the JIRA ticket, and that's going to start my sequence and then go through a notification process to say, hey, this is the JIRA ticket that got opened. I'll see that in Slack. It's going to do my deployment. Um, I'm going to set a feature flag. I'm going to run a test. And then that same evaluation that you, you we saw earlier, which is that quality gate, will um, take a look at that on an automated way and then update my tickets that this is taking place. So this is the power of, of cloud automation is that I'm not, if you're familiar with you know, code pipeline products, you know Jenkins file or Azure DevOps jobs, there's a lot of code that goes into this. So the idea of this is that it's declaring the activities and then through the event driven model, which Andy described, um, it's it's, it's acting upon just the event of a notification got triggered, then the downstream service, go do your work, tell me you're done. Hey, let's do a deployment triggered. All right, whatever tool did that, come back. So this is the idea of like loosely coupling tools, allowing you also to swap out the tools. So if you move from tool number one to tool number two, this definition would stay the same. And it allows you to have kind of a, 
kind of a, a consistent way that things are done and, um, and allowing you to have kind of some go governance over, over these processes. So that kind of introduction, I'll show you what, what it looks like in cloud automation, by, but I'll start off with running my ticket. So I'm just gonna come into my JIRA ticket and uh, you know, we'll just call it uh, you know, demo for you know, performance clinic, I'll just call it that. So what's gonna happen here is on it, and, and this is a specific thing to uh, JIRA. JIRA has a feature which um, I'll just, where you can have in JIRA the ability to um, um, configure um, automation tasks within JIRA itself. So JIRA, so this is a JIRA specific thing if you haven't been familiar with this, but what's happening is when I make a JIRA ticket, it's going to trigger the, um, the sequence in cloud automation. So what's happening behind the scenes is upon a issue was created or a JIRA issue was created, I'm sending this payload into cloud automation to say, hey, my, my, I want this release to start occurring. So this is auto, in an automated way now calling, if I go to my, um, my cloud automation environment, I can see that my release has, has been triggered automatically as a result of my JIRA ticket. So this may, may be the way you do it where you're doing releases off of a JIRA ticket, but you, you could imagine doing a code commit that would trigger this. And so what's happening with cloud automation, the, the event of, hey, let's start my release was triggered by my JIRA ticket JIRA told, passed in all the data about it, like, hey, this is my JIRA ticket number, et cetera. And now it's going through this flow. So as it goes from a release, the first task in my, my sequence here is a notification. And so what the notification was doing is, and I'll show you the details, but it calls out to two webhook services, which is how it, it gets out to uh, my downstream tool. So if I open up Slack, for example, I can see that I sent a message to Slack to say, hey, new JIRA ticket for my code, here it is. I can open up the ticket. And now um, this is my, my tracking of this process. So as we do this demo, you'll see that this ticket will get, get updated along the way. Um, so now here it's doing my deployment task. And what my deployment task was doing is was a webhook call out to GitLab to do my actual deployment. So I'm kind of simulating a deployment, but if I click on that, you can see that cloud automation triggered. Um, here I am now in GitLab, a hyperlink right to GitLab. And you can see that it did my deployment task. It's not really doing anything other than um, running deployment logic here, right? So it, it ran my deployment logic and passed back to cloud automation that it was completed. So you can pretend that it did that. And then same thing with a, uh, a testing step. So here I was calling a different webhook to a GitHub um, workflow. And if we open up that one, you can see you know, I'm simulating a test in this case, but imagine this was a wrapper to your load testing tool or, or whatnot. So the point of this is that you're triggering um, external tools and orchestrating this flow. And so when their job is when they're done, they, they do have to send back the cloud automation that my test event was finished and they can pass back details. And that's how those URLs and different things are showing up that you see. So here, after I do that, I'm running that evaluation stage, which is the same thing Andy showed, which could be our quality gate. So the idea here is I could, you know, open a JIRA ticket, it triggers the sequence, it deploys code, it can set a feature flag, it can test my code, and now do my evaluation. And this takes about a minute to process uh, because I, I'm looking back in time, so it has to wait a minute or two. But then the idea, what will happen here, I'll just show you one that finished, um, just for sake of time it would go in from a, a, a staging. I would, um, at the end, I'm gonna update my issue, which I, which I mentioned. So I'll open up one that's already been updated. And so what would happen, what's gonna happen is it will, the cloud automation automatically added a comment into my JIRA ticket to say, hey, my, you know, in this case, I got a warning phase for my SLO validation. I can click on this and come back to that previous release that I just did to kind of see the details of that release. So um, that's the idea. So now I'm, I'm, I'm linking together multiple tools. And then what would happen is, oh, maybe this one finished. Okay, so this the one that was running just finished, did the same thing. And then it moves on to a production phase. And because I it was a warning, I said I wanted a, man, a, 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 a manual approval because I got a warning on my SLOs. Do I really wanna push this to prod? 
and sure, I'm, I'm going for it. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead and let this run to prod and it's gonna go through that same flow of deploying, uh, testing, verifying SLO results. So this is um, um, what's happening. And then I guess, which will lead into the next demo, but I'll, I'll kind of let, let Andy kind of jump in. But what was happening with my feature flag just because that's kind of cool, I think, is um, I was running a Git, Git, GitHub job called set feature. And what it was doing was making a, a feature flag request out to my tool to send it to version two. So if you remember my sample app, I was on version one, I'll hit refresh. I'm now on version two. So there you go. So I, so the, so the orchestration changed my feature flag to version two. And if all goes right, Meanwhile, in Dynatrace, what's happening is this will be picked up by Dynatrace to create an incident for this open issue because we pushed it to production uh, with, with some bad code. And so what version two means is 50% of my, my calls to this app are going to result in a failure rate. So that's sort of simulating a problem here. So I don't know if any, anything you want to add to that. Uh, no, it's just... Uh... A lot of a lot of questions that are coming in. It's really great. A lot of stuff, and I I, I keep posting uh, also links uh, out there. But um, let's take the last fifteen minutes also get through a last use case and then do some 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 public Q and A. So let me just quickly take away your screen again. So folks, this was all around use case number four: orchestrating your existing DevOps tools. What Rob just showed with our cloud automation orchestration, where you can integrate all sorts of tools that you have through webhooks uh, that you can trigger. Uh, we also have other means to integration, but please uh, reach out to us on this. But Webhooks is really the greatest way because so many tools have great APIs and then we can we can call them. The link to the video, Rob, where you also did this demo, I just posted it into the chat as well. Now, the last use case is reduce mean time to repair. So we just saw the orchestration from Rob for a delivery use case for getting stuff safe and keep it in production. But now, the next use case is, what if you have something running in production and Dynatrace detects a problem that something is wrong? Let's, for instance, say you're burning too fast to the error budget because something is happening or some system is no longer available. Then we can use the same orchestration layer to orchestrate a sequence that may start with, hey, there's a problem. So, of course, let's create a new incident ticket, notify people about the update, maybe through Slack, uh, toggle the feature flag. I think you were alluding to this already. Uh, then again, evaluating. This is what you would do as a human being as well. You execute actions and then you evaluate by looking at logs at metrics if everything is good. What we have just done, we've built this at the core of our cloud automation orchestration. We always evaluate and then you can define and see what next to do. All right, with this, Rob, I wanna actually hand it over to you and I will also post this link to this recording um, into the chat in a second. But now please take it away and uh, take sure yeah. the last demo. All right, so let's do that. So what has happened in my environment? Let me go back to Dynatrace. So what has happened while we were talking, um, it's now opened up a problem called failure rate increase. Um, now I am monitoring the same app. So the, this, so the issue has not, is the issue has opened and closed a few times for the same service. So it's, it really just did occur. Um, and you can see what, and I'll just sort of maybe show you the outcome. So what happened was an issue got raised in Dynatrace. It called the, actually it's still, it looks like it's still running here. Um, like it's still running here. So it's now, um, it's yeah, running for two minutes. So now it's opened up, opened up a ticket as Andy showed, which is also is going out to Jira automation. So another thing in Jira um, that you can do is have an inbound webhook to Jira to open up an issue. So if I open up that Jira issue link, we can see that that cloud automation for my project just got opened um, momentarily ago. And we can see that this is um, all the hyperlinks and information for the Jira ticket that got open. But you can imagine if you're not using Jira for your incident management, maybe you're using PagerDuty, for example, or you're using maybe using X Matters, for example, which are also partners of Dynatrace, that you could you could direct an incident ticket um, into different tools um, and, as part of that flow. So then again, what we're doing is uh, we wanted to you know, simulate an automatic remediation. So that same set feature flag was called to that same GitHub job. And so we could look at the GitHub job. So it now made another, another um, 
entry here. If you're, if you're not familiar with GitHub and GitHub Actions, so built into GitHub, just as an aside, is the ability to configure um, jobs or workflows that run. And you can see this first set feature was when I turned it to uh, the bad release. This is the remediation one. So this one should be setting it to version one, back to version one. So if I go back to my app, refresh, there you go. Yeah, it worked. All right. So there I'm back on one, which is good. So demo so far, so good. So then as part of uh, notifying things, I wanted to do, I, I simulated a bunch of different webhooks um, of, of what's happening. And so if I go back to Dynatrace, for example, and what was happening, that's where it, it added. So I think I already showed it to you, but what it was doing, Dynatrace has an API to add comments into the problem ticket. So it's notifying this, for example, and I think I go back to Slack, if that's done, you can see, right, new incident got created with hyperlinks to the JIRA ticket. So you can see what's happening is, you know, a number of different tools. And again, your requirements are gonna be different, but the it, just like that flow Andy showed um, is what's showing you the art of the possible, right? And so whether you perform a remediation in an automated way, you may not be ready for that. It may be just a value to create a ticket and then run the evaluation to gather statistics about it because that's what a support engineer does. All right, let me gather some data so that's going to save you time just by gathering more information about the problem to hopefully hopefully resolve that that, that faster. Pretty so, powerful. And there's a lot of questions that I came that came in on on webhooks. I mean, the nice thing about this is this you can with with the webhook capability and the way we've set it up, you're basically subscribing a webhook to an event or to a task, which is a nicely loosely coupled way. Uh, basically, everything we do here in cloud automation is a is is a loosely a loosely coupled implementation of of uh, of orchestrating sequences of tasks. You define the process; we call them sequences of tasks. And on the other side, you basically specify what should happen when a certain task gets executed. The task execution itself is event driven. That means one of the things we built into the product is you can subscribe webhooks, but we also have other opportunities. What I've shown in my demo with executing a test, maybe where you don't have an API where you can configure Dynatrace through Monaco. So there's different ways how we can integrate with other tools. Uh, the core technology, because this was also asked, so cloud automation, what you see here, that core technology was actually donated by Dynatrace back to the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, as part of the Captain project. But for you as Dynatrace customers, right, we are hosting cloud automation for you. We are giving you these capabilities as part of your Dynatrace platform. And because we think the data is great that we have, but it really becomes powerful if you're doing data-driven orchestration. Right. And you can see, right, I mean, you might see my our URLs, but you can see this is SaaS um, hosted by Dynatrace. And just to show you, I mean, this we do have another video, maybe you want to put that video, but we do a deeper dive of how you actually configure these webhooks. But just to show you real quick what it looks like, you can see that built. So what this screen is in, in, in here is how the different services that are listening behind the scenes. The architecture of this is Kubernetes. So these are individual services that are listening and subscribing to the events flowing over this control plane of eventing. And so when you configure one of these webhooks for your project, we'll look at the open ticket one. What it's doing is saying, hey, for my project, I have a series of tasks. Those are all the tasks that were in that shipyard file. So I, you know, you're saying for the open ticket, when it gets triggered, because the, the life cycle is triggered, started, finished. So when it gets triggered, what do I want to do? I want to call out, in my case, to a webhook in Atlassian and send it this payload of information. So this tells the, the webhook, hey, I've got this project service stage. Here's some information. And that's it takes that data and puts it on the JIRA ticket. And then when it's finished, it sends back, hey, I'm finished. Here's the ticket number that I generated on, on JIRA. And, and just to show you a simple, another one, if we look at uh, say, um, maybe, I'm just trying to think another one, if there's a Slack one here. Uh, that's actually, that's another one. Uh, let me just show you a different one. Uh, I just wanna show you a, maybe this guy. But you can see I have multiple webhook subscriptions. This Actually, this is gonna be a little blurry, but you can see that at Slack, and if we also have an example with Microsoft Teams because all these, these type of tools have an API to say, post a message. So what I'm doing is this is sort of the format. Sorry, it looks a little yucky. 
but that's the format to generate this. And so that's how it, it's done. So there's really, there's a little technical glue that makes it work, but the, the, the concept, as Andy said, it's when you're working on a, a sequence, it's all an event-driven architecture. So when this sequence starts, it's a way down at the bottom here, it's a you know incident sequence got triggered. And then as each task takes place, like open ticket, let's go down to the bottom, it's open ticket triggered. So what you're listening for, for webhooks or other types of services would be listening for these events and that makes it loosely coupled. Awesome. Beautiful. Yeah. It's no, so beautiful. I mean we're we're excited it about it. And I think anyone that's an arc, I mean, so anyone that's an architect or, or uh, is on a DevOps teams and you're challenged with how do I, you know, add new tools or change tools and I have hundreds of pipelines, that's what really drove this. So Dynatrace internally, we're adopting this to orchestrate things because we want our tooling to be loosely coupled as well, right? So we we have hundreds and hundreds of pipelines ourselves to man, maintain. So this this architecture really, I think, makes a lot of sense to be an event-driven control plane and then subscribing and having the ability to attach services and custom services to it. And that's what's gonna, that's the future for our initiative, right? So we're gonna be investing with our partners um, of Dynatrace. Um, we have a whole bunch and a lot of these are gonna be uh, coming soon, you'll probably see some announcements, but when you go to, you know, the dynatrace.com, I can type, um, hub, um, this is our, our catalog of different partners and tools. And so as we are adding the webhook documentation, which is what I'm working on currently with our team, um, you will see, um, you know, ones that are out there and documented, this will have hyperlinks to the Dynatrace documentation, it will be in the Dynatrace documentation. So, um, and of course, Andy and I are also, I'll be always a reference a resource for you guys to reach out to for questions or getting started. And what's happening too, I think there was a question in the chat around, hey, you know, is Dynatrace University offering some classes around this or, or the services teams? And the answer is yes. So we're, each of the use cases Andy broke down we're gonna have like small little uh, you know, modules that you could do that. Our services team is being ramped up to deliver these uh, workshops and, and guides. So um, yeah, I don't know, Andy, anything else to add about kind of what's, what's coming and how people can get started? Yeah, no, I think let me actually just bring it home now because we have yeah. about two minutes left. And I know some of us have meetings to attend at the top of the hour. So thank you, Rob, for the awesome last demo. I already posted the link there as well, also to the webhooks. Um, and uh, to, to your action items, what you should have learned today, start adding some metadata to your existing deployments and get release visibility. Define your SLOs and put them on a dashboard. Get a cloud automation instance and automate release validation. If you want to get a cloud automation instance and you don't know how, remember, contact your Dynatrace representative, uh, use maybe the in-product jet and ask for it, um, and uh, or ex, uh, you know, reach out to Rob and myself. Then let cloud automation orchestrate your delivery sequences. Let cloud automation help you in automating tasks or parts of it of your release process. And then let cloud automation orchestrate your problem remediation. That's what we've seen. And yeah, with this, uh, I know I'm conscious of everybody's time. I think we have uh, answered all of the questions at least in the Q&A and in the chat. If there's more questions, uh, just let me know, and uh, yeah, for, let's 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 follow up. Oh yeah, that's a great one, uh, Rob. The um, the link, the link in. Uh, I'm sure you find us, right? I think I think you probably linked in with everybody. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, put, I'll put yours there too. Yeah, uh, yeah. but yeah, I mean, definitely, uh, you know, we're we're here um, to help you guys, so um, you, you won't have a hard time finding us. Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you. Yeah. With this, bye bye. Have a good night or good rest of your day. See ya.